Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this Griffin Bell lecture. This lecture series is named after the Attorney General who served under President Jimmy Carter. And we're very grateful to the Bell family for funding this lecture series that we have usually every year. Uh, especially, we'd like to welcome all the folks from outside of our campus. Thank you all guests for attending and it's great to see a wonderful turnout by students and faculty and staff. Uh, my name is Brian Adler. I'm the uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here. Um, today we have a, a wonderful speaker, Dr. Uh, Greg Hampikian, who is a professor of biological sciences and also has a joint appointment in the Department of Criminal Justice. Uh, if you, he's uh, based at Boise State University, and if you care to go on Boise State's uh, website and, and look for his uh, curriculum vitae, you'll, you'll find only about 20 pages of very small, dense type uh, about all the things that he has done. So I'm not going to tell you everything he's done, but he is the co-author of Exit to Freedom. Um, as you can see on the screen, he played an instrumental part in uh, freeing Amanda Knox, which really was a, you could call it a case of the century in terms of what happened to this exchange student uh, from Washington State in uh, Italy. Um, he is a frequent contributor to the New York Times um, op-ed pages. I won't read the title of one of his pieces, it's such a provocative title, maybe he'll share it with you, but that's up to him. Um, and. Um, He's done something that um, I, I only can dream about. Um, I'm an absolute fanatic for uh, Science Friday, which comes on, obviously, on Fridays on National Public Radio. Ira Flato is the host. Uh, Dr. Hampikian has been one of Ira's guests. And uh, if you haven't heard that program on NPR, you, you really ought to. It's, it's tremendous. Um, of course, Dr. Hempikian's uh, field is, is dealing with uh, DNA and uh, finding out who is innocent and who is guilty in a true sense, in a scientific sense, um, in an absolute provable sense. And it is the case uh, that we are living in a, a golden age of science. Uh, you know, the, the discovery of DNA and its structure is only maybe about 60 years old, really. So it's a very young science. And it's just absolutely tremendous uh, what can be done with it. If you're watching the news last night, for example, you, you might have come across the fact that um, there are about 500 uh, United States uh, Navy sailors who are buried in a mass grave in Hawaii uh, from World War II, from the bombing of Pearl Harbor. They were on the USS Oklahoma. They're going to start using DNA now to find out who, who these uh, young men were so that they can be returned to their families after uh, all those years um, in a mass grave from the Pearl Harbor. Um, so DNA is, a, is incredible. Dr. Hampikian is going to talk more about that. Uh, Dr. Hampikian um, has uh, many interesting other things that could be said about him, but I'll leave you with, with this, and he may want to elaborate on it. Again, if you follow the news um, recently, uh, the, the Armenian genocide has been in the news. Uh, because uh, it's something that the Pope, Pope uh, Francis, mentioned. Dr. Hampikian is of Armenian descent, and it is um, a very relevant topic for our world today as well. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Greg Hampikian. Ah, very, very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be back in Georgia. I taught at uh, Clayton State uh, for, I think, 12 years. I worked at the CDC on mosquitoes for a couple of years at Georgia Tech on uh, DNA electron conductance. Is, can DNA be made into wires? I got to work at Emory University. Uh, and now I have a lab at um, Boise State University in Idaho. And I get to do all kinds of great things. Um, I want you, all you young folks, to be as happy in your work as I am in mine. And I'll share with you what I share with my students and my children. In America, you will work very, very hard. Um, I've lived in other places. People get more time off um, in Australia and in Europe. But you'll work really hard here. And I say you can survive even a bad marriage 
better than a bad job. Because you will sleep with your husband or wife, but at work they keep you awake. <laughs> as bad as your home life might be, and I don't wish this upon anyone, it's a couple of hours at night and you're asleep. You wake up at 6 a.m., you get dressed in their clothes, you think about their problems, you mutter in the shower about your day, even if you love your job, you do that. You go and you slog for eight hours, dressed their way, answering their phones with their answers, and then you spend an hour or two unwinding before you get home. If you don't love your job, divorce it. Go back to school, find something else to do. That's the great thing about America is you can actually change your field. I've been very, very fortunate. I've had a, a number of jobs in this field. I started out in fruit fly genetics. Uh, as most gene many geneticists do at the University of Connecticut. But I was fortunate, a man named Henry Lee was director of the crime lab in the 1980s. And in the early 1980s, I got to know him. He worked with my advisor, Dr. Linda Straussbau. And um, the two people at the bench, I mean, we worked at a little bench this big, you know, for six years dissecting flies and grinding them up and such. The two people that worked on either side of me are now, um, have been in that lab, that crime lab for 25 years. Uh, I have consulted uh, uh, with them, uh, but really they're the ones who brought me in after 10 or 12 years of working on other problems in science. Forensic science is, um, is very interesting, but it's not the most interesting part of science. I think a lot of students want to go into forensic science. They come and talk to me. I have insisted we don't even have a major in it. I think you just train as a great scientist, and whatever you want to do in the subfield, you figure out later on. But uh, the main thing is to get a good education in science or in health, in my view, if you want to do the kind of things I'm talking about. So um, I'm going to open with a little explanation of um, the different things I do. So I run a laboratory. We work on cancer. And um, uh, I also work with police agencies. Uh, around the world now. I just published a paper last year with the French police. My mom lived in France the last 30 years of her life, and we saw the 10-year-old murder um, that um, there was no hope of solving until we used something called familial DNA. We looked for a relative of the person who left semen on a dead girl's body, and we found the father of the person, and therefore were able to find the man we think was the perpetrator. So I get to do all kinds of things, but one of the things I do is I um, direct the Idaho Innocence Project. And um, that's how I got really involved with Amanda's case. Uh, so I'll talk about that. But before I do it, I'd like to explain what we do at the various innocence organizations. And I think we're about to, you know, we've lost a national treasure uh, in Colbert. But Colbert kind of explains by having one of my friends on, not a case I worked on, but the 200th exoneree. So I just want to show you this. It'll explain to you a little bit about what um, Innocence Network organizations do. Welcome back to our viewers, assuming you were not murdered over the break by a recently released criminal. By the way, if you were murdered, you will be missed. But on the plus side, hello murderers. We value your viewership. Now, you might be wondering, why are record numbers of convicted felons free on our streets? Well, it's all thanks to the murder huggers at the Innocence Project. This nonprofit, and there's a red flag right there, this nonprofit claims that up to 10% of incarcerated criminals are wrongly convicted and they use DNA to overturn those convictions. Well, I don't care what a 30-year-old scrap of protein says. A lot of these guys confess. And a forced confession is still a confession. <laughs> Sorry, I don't see a big difference between, hey, a murderer confessed, and hey, someone confessed to a murder. <laughs> Plus, I think, as long as somebody's repaying the debt the society has owed, doesn't society's checkbook still stay in balance? I uh, don't fight it. You're going to clap, clap. You're not going to clap. Thank you. Doesn't that feel better? Either way, those boulders are still getting smashed. Sure, imprisoning innocent people is not ideal. But isn't the greater tragedy that we're finding out about it? That throws the entire criminal justice system into doubt. 
and it would totally wreck the vibe at my death penalty execution day parties. There's supposed to be a celebration. I am going to miss the Bush brothers. And besides, maybe these people weren't criminals before they went into prison, but 20 years can really put a chip on your shoulder. Look at the bitter rhetoric of Jerry Miller, who served 26 years before becoming the 200th person freed by the Innocence Project. I, I was, I was angry, you know, uh, depressed. You know, I felt like giving up in the beginning. When that sound went on, I realized that that was a waste of time. But just learn how to, you know, stay positive to make it out of it. That's the blessing. Sure. Well, this guy may be innocent, but he is guilty of making the rest of us feel guilty. <laughs> and folks, I'm going to put him on trial. Please welcome Jerry Miller. Hey, Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. Now, Jerry, thank you for coming on. And, and, and first of all, I just want to uh, say uh, that all of us in, in society are, are very sorry and, and would like to present you with this card. Uh, Jim, do we have that up there? It says, uh, we're sorry, sincerely, society. Um, because, uh, I mean, I have to say, sweet Lord, sweet Lord, are we sorry. How did, this, how did this happen? Or more importantly, how did you get found innocent eventually? Well, first of all, let me say, thank you, society. <laughs> but some money in this car would have been highly appreciated. <laughs> okay. 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 Now, I got to get one of those ones that hang dimes in. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. All right. So you, you uh, after 26 years, uh, uh, after being convicted 26 years ago, you were a, a DNA evidence free. Okay. okay. All right. Now, I don't think anybody innocent should be in jail, so I have proved that I'm not a monster. Okay. But let me read a little fire here, okay? Right. I'm a law and order guy. You were found guilty by a jury of your peers. Why should DNA get to come along and have a vote that overrides everything? Because it's science. Science is truth. You know, it'll, it'll correct the wrong like it did in my case. But if a jury gets to decide what truth is, <laughs> the 12 of them get to vote and say, we think the truth is that. And it should yeah. be settled. I mean, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty, but you were proven guilty. But the jury was wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, DNA was right. But if your jury was wrong, maybe every jury was wrong. Do you see how that throws our criminal justice system into chaos? Well, that's what it needs to be thought into, chaos. You know, if we cause a problem like this, innocent people to be convicted, okay. you don't have to do 26 years. Is, is, it, is, is it at all possible that the DNA is wrong and that you are in fact guilty, and that I'm in tremendous danger. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Is that possible? It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> that you are in danger. That I am in danger. <laughs> right or not? Right or not? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you not? Are you not at all angry at DNA itself? I'm not angry at DNA. Because for 26 DNA. years you were, you know, paying a debt to society, you know. And then suddenly DNA comes along and says, none of those years meant anything. Didn't they really just no, take those DNA years from you? DNA didn't do that. They didn't do that? No, DNA is going to make it possible for me to be repaid for what happened to me. Do you, do you think, are you going to see some scratch? Uh, I thought I would see some tonight. Do you think other people should get the same benefit that you did? If they were in the same position as me, yeah. But won't everybody say they're in your position? Everyone no. say I've got some. I'm Would you say you're in my position? No, I am not in your position. I but certainly, if I was in your position, I would say that uh, get some DNA and I'll be proven it. <laughs> no, it don't work like that. It you doesn't. Gotta be you got to be innocent. Yeah, That's a fact. Well, you what are you going to do with your freedom now that you've received it? We'll make a life, you know. Hopefully, uh, be successful. Well. Please enjoy your freedom. I'm sure you will more than the rest of us do. All right, Jerry Miller, everybody. We'll be right back. Um, Jerry's actually a, a friend of mine, as I said, and I'll see him uh, next month. Uh, I look forward to it. We have a meeting every year um, of the Innocence Network, and um, a lot of the exonerees come down, and that's great. And Jerry got a settlement 
Um, I, I can't remember what the issue was, but um, I believe there was some pr prosecutorial misconduct. Anyway, he, he got a settlement that I think was over a million dollars after a couple years when he's out. Um, that's not um, always the case. The, um, in my own state, in Idaho, a man um, who I've worked with, I didn't work in his case, but I'm working with him and trying to get him some compensation. He spent um, 19 years or 18 years on death row for the murder and rape of a nine-year-old girl down the road from where I live, about 10 miles from where I live. And uh, his compensation was they took him to the prison laundry and he got to pick out a, a set of dungarees and a jacket. That was it. Uh, Charles Fane. So, um, uh, if you want, I, I, I'll have, uh, I think, copies of my book available with a Georgia exoneree, Calvin Johnson, uh, and you can read about his story. And uh, he's a good friend, and maybe next year you guys could have him out. He wasn't able to come out with me today. So um, I'll talk about Amanda Knox's case as an example of um, not where DNA goes right at the beginning, but where there's some DNA that does both things. DNA that goes right and is interpreted properly, and then some very speculative, small amount of DNA that is misinterpreted. And that's pretty much going to be a theme of what I talk about today, because um, a lot of you are in nursing, I, I know, and some of you are in science. And when we watch those shows on TV that talk about how phenomenal um, this field that I get to work in is, how, how wonderful forensic DNA is, I think what we forget sometimes is it's also people like me sitting in lab with tubes this big that you really can't read what's on that tube no matter how good your eyes are and mine aren't that great anymore. And things happen like mix-ups or like I forget to change my gloves or when I'm popping one of these little caps open, maybe a tiny bit of DNA gets aerosolized and moved around. And so I'm going to talk about some of those issues of error because I think some of you are going to be in laboratories or are going to be in um, operating rooms and you're going to see error. Error is there everywhere all the time. What you do about the error you see is going to define who you are in terms of integrity. And that's, that's really the measure. It is the measure of addressing your own error and error you can identify in a system. I tell you that you are graduating into a field where people are wrongly being killed, whether that's in the criminal justice system where 152 death row inmates have been exonerated. 152 people who were found guilty, went through all the various trials, and I've been through the, both the trials and, and through the um, uh, commutation um, hearings here in Georgia, uh, pardons and paroles hearings, and those take years and years and years, but some of these folks were on death row for more than 20 years before the error was found and they were completely freed. If you're in nursing or medicine, same thing. There are errors. My father, I believe, was killed through poor nursing. Somebody forgot to aspirate him. He had, uh, had had a stroke and it was Christmas and uh, the B team was there at the hospital and they sent a poor young nurse in to tell me and I quote, you don't want an autopsy, do you? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, there are mistakes being made everywhere. I make a lot of mistakes. I'm not going to broadcast them all here for you, but if you get on the web, you can find people who think I've made mistakes. Um, and the point is, error analysis is, is everything in science. So when I first got into forensic science, I went to the national meeting, and the head of the FBI was in a room with about, I don't know, eight or ten times as many people as are in here. They were all DNA experts in forensics. I wasn't. And I raised my hand and I said, what's the error rate at the FBI DNA lab? And he said, zero. And I laughed, thinking he was joking, and said, where did you find such a small ruler? Uh, you know, uh, that point of error is you have to measure it. If we are only considered with things like um, how many people recover after a surgery or how many people benefit from a drug or how many times we get the, raw, the right person in jail, the right one who did it, that is not error analysis. And I'll give you an example. If all you consider is the things we do right, then the Salem witch trials were an astounding success because more than 100% of the witches were convicted. <laughs> Think about it. 
the, the point is you can't measure successes to determine error. You have to do the very hard work of looking for mistakes. Uh, and so I'll talk about some of the things that happened in Amanda's case. Now Amanda Knox uh, was a, a young person, um, uh, I think in her second year of, of uh, university in Washington State. Uh, she had been a high school athlete. She was interested in Italian and literature, and she did what many of you are thinking of doing or have done. She went abroad for a semester. How many people have gone abroad or are thinking of it? Is anyone here doing that? Is there a program here for going abroad? It's a great thing. My daughter went, was abroad. She was abroad at the same time that poor Amanda um, was in prison, and so I had a, a lot of sleepless nights about that. But what happens is she goes to um, live in Italy, there's international students living in this little uh, like townhouse flat. There's boys downstairs, there's a group of girls upstairs. And um, she goes over to this, to her friend's house, a boyfriend, now everyone calls him, but they were only together a couple of weeks. She's gonna spend the night at his house and then come back in the morning. And when she comes back in the morning, there's a little bit uh, amiss in the house. And you may have seen photos where they show blood all over and all. Well, that's actually the luminol you're probably seeing, which makes things glow. Uh, it's not, there wasn't a lot of blood, but, but she finally notices a broken window, and so she calls her boyfriend to have him come over. S her roommate's door is locked. She's a little troubled by that. That's not usually done. No one else is in the house. And they come in, and they finally um, call the police. The police are there, and um, some of the other uh, girls who live in the house, their boyfriends around, and one of the boyfriends found, I think the police didn't want to break the door because they thought the kids, you know, were just getting a little scared over nothing. Uh, one of the kids broke the door and they saw Meredith Kircher's body inside. Uh, one, of the, one of the housemates, the flatmates from England, uh, had been killed. Okay, so what happens? Well, in science, and forensic science, are we allowed to have a gut feeling? The answer is yes, yeah. What do we call the gut feeling in science? Hypothesis. Hypothesis. And it is a strong statement. You know, I work on cancer drugs, and every time we go, I'm like, this drug is gonna cure breast cancer. That's my hypothesis. You can't be like, well, maybe. It's, in science, it has to be an affirmative statement that can be rejected by the data. And so um, Amanda Knox is developed as a suspect because of her uh, behavior and what one of the detectives uh, uh, things um, is uh, uh, suspicious behavior. So the question I like to ask people is, well, what is normal behavior for a 20-year-old who finds her roommate dead overseas? <laughs> and the, um, the example I give you is, you know, I was teaching at the university on uh, September 11th when the Twin Towers were hit, and a student uh, came into my office to tell me, one of my close friends who'd been in the military, who then re up she was a mom, of three kids, and she uh, re-upped right after that. But um, we went and we were watching the video, and I would ask you, what was the normal behavior in those towers? Was the normal behavior the people who rushed in to help, even though it was clear they were probably going to their death? Was the normal behavior the people who held hands with a stranger and jumped out of a window? Was the normal behavior getting on your knees and praying, screaming? What is normal? under circumstances like that. And I think it's legitimate to ask, do the studies and find out. But that's not how the system operates. I'll also tell you that in terms of lie detection, the polygraphers, the people who run the polygraphs, will claim to have about a 90% accuracy in controlled settings. They'll also tell you that skilled people who know polygraphs can fool them. Um, but all of the studies show that even with experienced people, and we all think we're experienced at judging character, your parents thought they could tell when you were lying. Remember when they caught you and you said you were sorry? And they thought it was the only time you did it. <laughs> Even with experienced interrogators, experienced detectives, the rate is a coin flip. It's 50%. We are not good at telling people um, are, are telling the truth or lying. That's why. Nobody can win you know, the poker championships just because they have training and interrogation. It turns out it's very hard to tell. So this gut feeling starts things out. And again, I'm gonna take um, the benefit of a, uh, of a video um, because I think they do a really great job and it tells it in a more interesting way. Whoops. 
So um, let me set up this, uh, this second video for you. We, uh, we lose a trial. So how do I get involved in this case? I'm in England for my son's wedding. My son was a Georgia State graduate, met a British woman at a meeting here in Atlanta. And so we all went to England for this wedding. Well, while I'm in England, uh, they hear that I'm in England in London and ask me to train up to, to work on a case at the Forensic Science Service. So I have you know, some extra time. I leave the family behind in the Midlands. I go up to London. I work on this case. It's about very small amounts of DNA, low template. And so I start doing research. What are they doing in France with low template? What are they doing in Italy, et cetera? And somebody says, well, you should look at the Amanda Knox case. She's at trial already. I'd heard of her case. But in England, it was sensational. It was on the front page of all the papers. Uh, and so I got through to somebody on the legal team. And I said, look, I'm doing research on low template DNA, low amounts of DNA across Europe. Uh, you know, could I get the standard operating procedures that they use in Italy uh, from you if you have them? And uh, also, I'll take a look at the data if you want me to. I'll, I'll even give you an opinion on it. From there, I think it was the next week I was in Rome collecting all this data. Pretty soon I'm, in, I'm uh, involved with the case. I meet the family and it kind of snowballed. I didn't realize it was going to be a seven year uh, commitment. Now they had good DNA people on the ground in Italy. They had an Italian DNA expert, but I was kind of uh, rallying and trying to sense uh, what was going on internationally. And eventually we got a bunch of scientists who signed on to a letter of uh, objecting to what happened to her. But we, are, we lose at that trial. They don't allow my report into to court. Um, and um, we then get to the appeal. Amanda's sitting in prison. She's been found guilty, her and her boyfriend, Rafael Celestito. And we're at the appeal phase. So we've lost at one trial. We're at the appeal. This is, uh, we'll go to, to an Anderson Cooper clip. So Drew Griffin, who's an investigative reporter with CNN with Anderson Cooper, uh, did this story, and I think it sets it up pretty well. Work on punishment time to Italy, the murder case against America, Amanda Knox may be unraveling. A judge today rejected the prosecution's request for new DNA testing, a welcome victory for the former college student as she is fighting her conviction for killing her British roommate, Meredith Kircher. Knox and her ex-boyfriend, Rafael Solecito, were found guilty in 2009, two years after Kircher's partially clad body was discovered in the house they, uh, they shared in Perugia. The DNA evidence used in the original trial has since been called into question, and without the ability to retest, prosecutors are left with little time Knox to the crime. So how was she convicted in the first place? That's really a good question to ask. Critics say it was a badly handled investigation by a prosecutor who rushed to judgment. His name is Giuliano Manini. Earlier this year, Drew Griffin of CNN Special Investigations Unit traveled to Perugia for a rare interview with Manini, one that quickly revealed the weakness of his case and the mistaken arrest of Amanda Knox's boss, a guy named Patrick Lumumba, even though he was working at his own bar the night of the murder. Here's Drew's report. Police apparently didn't bother to check the facts about Lumumba. They immediately arrested Amanda Knox, Rafael Solicito, and Patrick Lumumba for the murder of Meredith Kircher. Nene and police announcing to the public, case solved. Giuliano Manini admitted to us, even without any evidence, he knew almost the moment he arrived and laid eyes on Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solicito, they were involved in the murder. Prior to the forensic investigation, prior to everything really, your intuition or your detective knowledge led you to Amanda Knox and Raphael Solicini. After the first few weeks, we were convinced because of the behavior of the two people, and especially Amanda, that they were both involved in the crime. But almost immediately after the arrests, Manini had a problem. The third suspect, Patrick Lumumba, had an airtight alibi. He was in his car that night. He could not have been involved. Then, the actual forensic tests came back. When I looked at him, um, I was horrified. Greg Hampinke is a forensic biologist at Boise State University and director of Idaho's Innocence Project. He also is working with the Knox defense team. He says Italian investigators did a good job processing the crime scene, collected excellent evidence, 
but clung to shakier evidence that proved their theory. A classic error, says Hampinkian, a prosecutor who trusted his gut feeling instead of the science that at that time was pointing to another suspect. When the DNA is finally processed, it's not any of their suspects. So what do you do? And what would you do? You let them go. <laughs> As Patrick Lumumba was being released from jail, investigators analyzing the bloody evidence left at the crime scene found an entirely new suspect. His name, Rudy Cadet, a known petty criminal from the Ivory Coast who fled to Germany shortly after the murder. It turns out Gaudet's handprint, made in Meredith Kircher's own blood, was found in the victim's room. Gaudet's DNA found inside the victim's body in her vagina. His DNA on her clothing, on her purse. His feces even found on used toilet paper left near an unflushed toilet down the hall. Knowing all of that, and, and when he finally got extradited from Germany back down to Italy, we thought, you know, thank God this is over. It wasn't. Giuliano Menin would stick to his instincts, despite the forensic evidence. He was so long. I did what I did because I was convinced, given the evidence that had been gathered, that they were responsible. I am absolutely convinced. Rudy Gaudet, the African director, was convicted in the murder of Meredith Kircher, and Gaudet also fingered Rafael Solecito and Amanda Knox as his accomplices, even though he never met Solecito and barely knew Knox. Closing arguments for the appeals case are going to be held at the end of this month, and Amanda Knox's family is very, very hopeful. Okay. So um, what happens is um, we're, we're in that uh, appeal, and... Uh, the pieces, there's two pieces of evidence that I'll talk about uh, briefly to just show you what it was all hinging on. When they go through the room where Meredith Kircher was killed, the day of the murder, they take samples from all over. I had to watch you know, hours and hours of video with this poor girl's uh, body there. And the team's doing a really great work uh, uh, collecting all the evidence. And from all of the samples that they got from the room, and there's that bloody handprint on the wall they showed you, there's an impression of a knife on her bedding. There's what looked to be a semen sample that no one processed near the pillow. Uh, that was never done. But anyway, they, they collected a lot of great evidence. Nothing in that room has anyone's DNA except Meredith Kircher and Rudy Gaudet, this suspect that they finally come to. And they only come to him because they have him in the fingerprint database. His fingerprint's on the wall. They had no idea he was involved until the DNA all says points to him. There's nothing from Amanda in that room. There's nothing from Raphael in that room. Two pieces of evidence are used to incriminate them, though. There is a knife that's collected from Raphael, the boyfriend's house, which is, I don't know, walking distance away, about less than a mile anyway. And uh, they collect a kitchen knife. Now, he's a bachelor in a flat. The knives come with the flat. They just collect the top one. The police took one knife. They bring it in, there's a bunch of tests done on it, and on one of the tests, they get some of the victim's DNA, or what they claim was DNA consistent with the victim. It's not a complete profile, but it is consistent with the victim. Victim has never been to that house. How did her DNA get there on the blade of a knife? So let me show you the actual knife. And we got copies of this taken to my lab so we could work on them uh, and pry it apart and also examine how contamination might have been a possibility. Uh, but where they find uh, DNA with the victim is that B spot over there. On A, they find Amanda Knox's DNA. Well, she says, I was at his house cooking that night. You know, we only use that knife, and yeah, that's why I'm there. Uh, but what about that spot on B? Now, this knife has been tested many, many times, and what happens in the appeal process is the judge at the appellate level says, you know what? Once again, I don't want to hear from uh, the defense experts in Italy, the, the DNA expert uh, on the defense team. I don't want to hear from the original lab that did it for the police. I don't want to certainly hear from, you know, Hampikian and uh, uh, Elizabeth Johnson and the others in America who are uh, uh, trying to send aid in. I'm going to send this knife to two experts in Rome, <laughs> independent rec experts, and see what they say. They do a study. It comes back exactly like what we had been saying. 
and so much so that there are these great internet rumors that somehow we colluded, like they would, why would they listen to me? But anyway, uh, you know, they're great, great experts uh, at the university in Rome. Uh, but in any case, they say this was an unreliable bit of DNA. It was unrepeatable. They tried to repeat it. And also the laboratory, which was not accredited at the time, they had applied for accreditation, had no ability to go as low as they did to look for DNA. So let me explain this. We set our instruments at a certain level of reading. Uh, at this time, the FBI set it at what we call 200 RFUs. We ignored DNA below 200. The reason for that, one of the reasons for that is you get cells carried in by people. You'd see a lot of contamination if you look that low. You don't want to look at every piece of DNA. You guys are going to be leaving with other people's DNA today, right? You're picking it off your chairs. Uh, the cup that was handed to you at the coffee shop had somebody else's DNA, which now goes on your hand, which you'll touch. And it just gets diluted like it was some sort of chocolate pudding stain. But it does transfer very easily. And so this little bit of DNA that was on B was unreliable, unrepeatable, and I said the FBI is using 200, 250 at that time, I think even, as a cutoff. I, my lab went to 200. None of the peaks of that even went beyond, I think, 110. So nobody uh, working at the US at that time would have looked at any of the DNA on that. All right, so um, what ends up happening for Raphael, the second piece of um, evidence, is this. So I told you nothing was found in the room where uh, Meredith Kircher was killed the day of her murder that implicated either Raphael or Amanda. But they come back 46 days later after a couple of teams have been through and um, after uh, Amanda and Raphael been allowed to go back and get their stuff from the, from the uh, apartment and they find this. A piece of evidence that had been photographed from the victim the day of the murder, but they forgot to pick up, I guess. Uh, and so it was left on the floor in the room after all the teams had gone through and everything's a mess and there's fingerprint powder all, all over the place, and they picked this up. And um, the other thing is they said they changed their gloves every time and they were using clean gloves. Well, I watched the videos. I know they weren't changing their gloves between each piece of evidence. So we replicated that in my lab. I told my lab to collect knives that we got from the dollar store and soda cans from the dean's office. And, uh, not, and change their gloves only every other piece of evidence. So they handle a soda can, then they unpack a knife. We looked at five cases like that. We took it down to the sensitivity the Italians had, and we saw transfer from people who worked in the dean's office onto knives they'd never touched. I, I have that data with me, but I won't show you. So this question of contamination became very, very important with that. Um, and let me show you uh, what we were finally able to get, which was a video of the collection of this um, bra clasp. Now, when you collect evidence, especially as we're increasing in sensitivity, you have to be very, very careful. You should have gloves on, but think about what the glove does. The glove does two things. It protects you from the evidence, and it protects the evidence from you. Does it protect the evidence from other evidence? No, and if you touch one thing with your glove and touch something else with your glove, guess what you're doing? You might as well just be swabbing and transferring as if you're collecting DNA. DNA moves very easily, unlike a traditional fingerprint. Um, so it became a, a big question, how was this bra class handled? I'll just show you, this is 46 days after the murder. They go back with the team. The video, unfortunately, doesn't start um, where I'd want it to start, which is, you know, how did they actually find this piece of evidence? but it starts somewhere in the middle. Now you should take a clean set of forceps right out of the wrapper, or you should have it soaked in bleach, not in alcohol as they were doing at the GBI. They had a big problem with that that we exposed recently. Alcohol does not get rid of DNA, it preserves DNA. <laughs> bleach gets rid of DNA. Anyway, um, they confuse two words, and I mean, I, you know, we all do this. We have lab, and I train people in lab. You say sterilize by accident instead of saying decontaminate. And sterilize is alcohol, decontaminates bleach. People get mixed up, they start using alcohol to get rid of DNA, and in fact, they're not. But you should be using a fresh pair of forceps or something that's been in bleach. You put it in a paper bag so that there's no moisture trapping, that the, the mold will grow like on your sandwiches. Mold eats DNA. Let's watch and see if this was collected properly. So it starts in the beginning, and where they found the DNA, by the way, is right in that metal, right at the metal hook of this um, 
a piece of cloth that some say were, was cut from her body. I, I think it might have just been ripped, actually. But anyway, it's a torn piece of the, the bra. The DNA from Rafael Celesito, or DNA consistent with him, is found supposedly on that metal clip. Let's watch how it's collected. There's the metal. Boom, boom. Let's just hold it by all of this. This is why you don't handle evidence. You pluck it and bag it. <laughs> so when this was being played at the appeal, this is what happened. People were laughing in the, in the courtroom. You don't have to really be highly trained to see what the problems are here. Now, no one knew this would be the one key piece of evidence, I mean, unless somebody created it for that purpose. But still, this is going to be the only piece of evidence that incriminates Rafael Celesito. And it's 46 days after, and this is how it's handled. And its provenance has been held in question. Where was it for 46 days? Well, it wasn't where it was left. We know it's been moved because it wasn't where the photograph was found, the, the earlier photograph. I don't know what's going on here. They're looking for DNA on it or whatever. I mean, there's absolutely no reason to handle a piece of evidence at the scene, right? And where was that flashlight? You know, has that flashlight been, been treated the way it should? If you're handling it with a flashlight, handling it from one person to another. All right, so now are we done? Is it going to go in the bag? <laughs> <laughs> I think they forgot to photo where they found it. And so they thought, well, let's just put it back and photo where it was. <laughs> now, again, this kind of stuff happens. Yes, even in like, you know, hot, uh, uh, with highly experienced people at a murder scene. But when this is the one piece of evidence, you can see why it was, um, why it was questioned. And again, you know, I told you it should have been picked up with clean forceps put in a bag, no one else handles it, it gets to the laboratory under seal and uh, can be processed a number of times. But now it's been touched by everybody or by several people uh, by the, on the metal clasp and what do they put it in? A plastic bag. Now the unfortunate part about that is later on they swab it with water to get the DNA off, it's put back in a plastic bag. By the time it gets to retesting it's completely crumbled, the metal has rusted. Uh, because you don't want to trap moisture for metal or for DNA. So those were two of the problems. All right, so um, we, uh, we're waiting for the results, um, and I'll just show you briefly what happens in the courtroom, because I think we're near the end of the time, right? Could, uh, what time am I allowed to go till? Okay. Um, so um, I'll show you what happens in the courtroom just really briefly. So I was... Uh, I happened to be at CNN because I was here for a death penalty trial and uh, they knew I was in Atlanta the day that this verdict was going to come down for the appeal. So um, I, was, I was sitting with, um, with Brooke. Let me just set this up for a second just to show you like, what a crazy day this was um, and yet we had crazier in this case. So we're uh, waiting Alex for the appeal and Tino, verdict. Greg a DNA expert and professor of biology and criminal justice at Boise State University, also chief of uh, the Idaho branch of the Innocence Project, friend of the Knoxes. Uh, so I just want to show you, this is what's family. going on in Italy, family. this giant crowd outside the courtroom. The, break, the family's from, all there. Uh, and yeah, I'll say that the uh, same thing that we're hearing is that uh, there's movement and time to get into the courtroom, so everybody's uh, you know, on tender hooks. It's up to the jury and the judges at this point. The six and two. Um, I, I did want to ask, and we were talking about this earlier, and I think our viewers would find this fascinating, uh, is that, you know, obviously this is happening in Perugia, Italy, it's mm -hmm. an Italian courtroom, they're all speaking Italian, you heard Amanda speaking uh, fluent Italian uh, this morning, but the Knox family, they don't speak Italian. No. They're sitting in that courtroom watching essentially the fate of their daughter mm -hmm. and not comprehending what's happening. No, they have, there are some volunteers who have helped from time to time trying to translate, but you can imagine what happens 
in a courtroom if you have somebody whispering next to you the whole time. And I'm sure that the judge wants them to keep that down. And sometimes there's no one with them translating, and they just have to try to figure it out best they can. How do they do that? I think it's just very difficult. It's always hard when you have a foreigner in a courtroom. That's you know their family is left out. Let's go back to the DNA evidence. We're mm -hmm. talking about the uh, the kitchen knife and the mm -hmm. rock glass. Right. And on appeal, this judge it was up to the judge who said, before we continue on, I want to have independent mm -hmm. forensic experts take a closer look at these two pieces of evidence. And what did those experts find? Well, they, they said everything we had said, you know, that I had said two and a half years ago, and that uh, the defense experts, the top. And I'm just going to cut it. We talk about contamination there, but I'll show you what happened actually in the courtroom. Now, remember, this is that we lost a trial. Now we're in the appeal. She's been in prison. Rafael's been in prison. And um, we're waiting to hear what happens. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that she's freed here, but she comes back uh, to, the, to the States, and we're happy as can be. Uh, we go camping out in Idaho for five days with the family, and uh, uh, you know everybody's relaxed. And we know it can be appealed to the Supreme Court in Italy for a third hearing in court. But we we told that's just for technicalities. Nobody's going to get thrown in prison. Blah blah blah. Maybe some fines will be reversed or whatever. Uh, she ends up being having her her freedom reversed. So they find her. Uh, they send it back down to the court for a fourth time at the appellate level, the second level. That appellate level reconfirms her conviction. She's in Seattle. Raphael's in Italy while it's going. This is going on for three years. And um, it was just last month. Uh, I was in Seattle uh, preparing with uh, her family the week before. And I'll tell you the truth. I thought she was going to be found uh, guilty again at the top because I just didn't see the court reversing that quickly. Or at best, I hope they would send it back to the appellate level and we'd get another shot. Uh, but I thought we were going to the European Court of Human Rights, or it was going to be, you know, with the State Department, whether she'd be extradited. I had, I really didn't have faith in the Italian court at that point, just personally. I mean, it just happens after a while. So it was a complete shock she was freed to me this last time. Now, some of the people on the legal team said, no, we knew it was going to happen. I, I was just surprised that the court would change so quickly. But this is at the appellate level when she's in prison, and um, this is what actually happens in court. Now, uh, you know, I'm sitting at CNN trying to listen. We don't have a translator. And the first thing that the judge says is that she's guilty of calumny, which is that she made false statements about her boss, because they presented her boss as a possible suspect to her, had her do a hypothetical thing that they sometimes do in questioning this awful thing where you mislead people or you lead them down a, a path they think they're trying to help themselves and they just say anything. It's just ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, they, they, she said something, and so the first thing the judge says is she's guilty of doing that, of calumny, which is a fine. And so some of the newspapers that had stories already written <laughs> pushed the guilty button, and stories went out all over the world that Amanda Knox was found guilty of murder. Um, and I actually have some of those stories here because it's just wild. Uh, even my own college university got this wrong. Uh, my newspaper got this wrong. And... Um, <clears throat> What actually happens is this. So let me, let me just play it, <clears throat> and then we'll end it, and I can take questions. <clears throat> this is in the courtroom in Italy that we're watching uh, what's going on. There's Amanda in the center. They're going to flash to her mother. This is um, one of her lawyer's assistants. And if she's found guilty, she gets slapped back. The van's waiting outside uh, you know, um, with chains to take her away. Please, silence, please, silence, please. 
Okay. <clears throat> I, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to be in courtrooms uh, uh, all over the world. Uh, I was in Crete recently testifying. And not all courtrooms are like American courtrooms. American courtrooms are very dignified places. A judge will throw you out. You know, if I forgot my jacket like I did in the hotel room today, I'm embarrassed to say. I mean, I wouldn't be allowed to testify in a lot of courtrooms in Georgia. Uh, a huge uh, uh, emphasis on decorum and, uh, and respect. The Italian courtroom is a very noisy place where people, same thing in Greece, where people just storm out. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, uh, lawyers where I was uh, on a case just stormed out and left us. The judge is looking, I'm looking, nobody knows what's going on. He came back a few minutes later. Uh, so this is the kind of chaos that we saw. Um, uh, and it doesn't mean it's a bad justice system. Again, you know, at the appellate level, a judge is or able to order a new DNA test there. That never happens here. Here, my case is here last 10, 15 years. So though Amanda's case lasted seven years, or that I was part of it, seven, I think eight years she was involved, uh, that's pretty fast for one of these types of cases. Um, I just want to show you, oops, there we go. So that's Thanksgiving, uh, you know, six weeks after the first time she was free, but she would still, for three years, have to wait for this final verdict. Uh, and, uh, but that was just after she got out, and then we all went camping, uh, and that's her jumping into Hell's Canyon uh, in my home state of Idaho. I just want to briefly show you some Georgia stuff. This is a case uh, where a man is still in prison here uh, for what I think is a bad interpretation by the GBI, where they have a mixture of DNA from a rape victim in Georgia, and they claim that Kerry Robinson cannot be excluded from that. Because they have a fact, DNA says he can't be excluded from the mixture, a co-conspirator can now testify, a guy whose DNA is completely in that rape. Everybody agrees that his semen is on this, uh, on this victim. He testifies. The guy who testifies get, is out of prison, right? He gets a shorter sentence. Kerry Robinson, who, who the victim couldn't pick out and uh, who this guy, the, the other guy knew from high school, is still in prison because he claims he's innocent. That's the price that you pay. Now, I took that same data, uh, and this was published in a peer-reviewed journal in, in, um, in England, uh, a very well-respected journal. And we took the same DNA data from this GBI case. We gave it to 17 experts at another North American crime lab, 17 people all trained at the same lab, all working on the same stuff, all using the same protocols, looking at the same data. And we said, is, is this profile, it was Kerry Robinson's, included in this? excluded or it's inconclusive. We got all three results and only one of those 17 analysts agreed with the GBI. So this is a, a problem with mixtures, DNA mixtures, complex mixtures and interpretation that I think is an international problem. Um, they're telling me I have to wind it up. I had some other Georgia cases, but you know, stick around if you want to talk afterwards. Do we have time for questions or no? Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got about five minutes for questions. Out of, okay. out of respect for your time, so yeah, feel free to ask anything at all. So, and I have some swabs in the bag if anybody needs to be swabbed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I always carry some swabs. So, <laughs> does anybody have any questions? Yeah. If you shout, maybe I could repeat it if you want. Yeah. Is that the trace was really small and yeah. it was tested many times, so was there enough DNA to do that? No. So, so how was tested many times? Because so what that's a very good question. Yeah. So how can we test many times when there's low amounts of DNA? So what they did originally was they took several spots on the blade and so I should explain what this is. You know, the, the victim is stabbed a number of times. The final lethal cut is really deep across the neck. Could have been made with any knife, they tell me. I'm not an expert in wounds. But, but there are small wounds that could not have been made with this knife, first of all. So the knife doesn't fit all of the wounds or the ones that can be characterized. It also doesn't fit the bloody impression of a knife that's on the bed. So there's problems with the knife right away. Um, and when they check several spots, they don't get anything. Uh, you know, uh, they get 
oh, when they retested this, they did get something. They got potato starch. <laughs> so when this knife was tested for blood, and the, and the tests for blood are good to parts per 100,000 or per million, it's very hard to wash blood completely from an instrument. You, you, you'll, unless you really know what you're doing, you're going to have a very hard time. Uh, and so there's no blood on this knife. Well, how do you make a wound across the neck end up with a tiny little spot? So what they said is, well, she bought bleach and cleaned it, right? Uh, and they tried to show that, and it, it was just spurious. There was no, no purchase of bleach. Um, what we said, the head of the FBI, former head of the FBI lab, joined us with an affidavit at the end. Again, the judge didn't accept the affidavit. But uh, what, what uh, Bruce Badoli said was, well, let's split the blade here, because if you go home to your knives, I guarantee you every meal you've ever eaten is preserved in that crud right there. <laughs> just go home and look at your knife. And when you, you know, when you would use this in a very bloody event, right, wh whether you were killing or cooking or whatever, um, you're likely to get some of that material trapped there. So we asked that it be pried apart and gotten in there. Nothing. There was nothing but starch in this, on this knife. No one had cut their hand on it. Certainly no one had had their neck cut with it. So when I say they tested it many times, you know, there are other areas that were tested. Just trying to repeat this. The other thing is the amount of DNA here wasn't even enough DNA for one DNA test. I'm not convinced that they actually used the right spot. Um, you know, I showed you those tubes. Tubes get swapped up. They're, you know, there are mistakes that happen. That's why you want to always have more than one one piece of uh, evidence when it's something like this, but so, sometimes there isn't. Any other question? That's a very good question. So she was convicted and then she had to Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, this happens in the States too. Sometimes we will get people, so in other words, if we challenge a conviction through one of the innocence networks, um, a judge might vacate the conviction, and this just happened uh, in a case in Idaho where this poor guy's been in prison, gosh, since the 80s. Um, and uh, I think it was, it was actually uh, 30 years ago today that he went into prison. Charbonneau's his name, and he just, they just filed the finding in the court. The court vacated it, his conviction. Now we have to see if the state's going to recharge him, which I doubt they will in this case. What is proof? You know, I try to teach my students. Pr there's no <coughs> proof but conviction, and that's what Jerry Miller and, uh, and Mr. Colbert show us, is, you know what, in the end, we're deciding. Even in science, I send an article out, two out of three editors, you know, reviewers think it should be published, it gets published. If it doesn't get published in the first one, I can go to another journal. Same thing in the courts. Sometimes you get more than one bite of the apple, even though, you know, technically things are supposed to be um, decided, you sometimes get to go back. So yes, yeah, she was convicted, freed. Uh, it was sent back to the middle level, so that was the third time. The fourth time, reconvicted, and then the fifth time, ultimately freed. It can't go back anymore. They tell me no more, no more, nothing um, through the Italian courts. Yeah. Gosh, that's a good question. I don't remember. It was several weeks before they got the hit, I, th I thought. You know, I should, I should review that. But what happened is they, they arrested Amanda and, and Raphael. They have, uh, Amanda's there, you know, as an exchange student. She's been there a few weeks. They don't give her what they're supposed to give her, which is a neutral translator. They put a police officer in to translate with her. They have her do a hypothetical about, well, we're, you know, could you have blah, blah, blah. And she's writing all the time, well, I, this didn't really happen, or I don't think this happened, or whatever. And she says something finally, well, maybe I was there and I heard screaming. And because they found a cell message from her to her boss saying, see you tonight, you know, because she was going to work. Uh, and they thought he was involved. So that's, she ends up, you know, making a statement against him. They arrest him. Anyway, they, they're going down this kind of rabbit warren of, of gut feelings, and then suddenly they, somebody does the fingerprint on the wall in the blood of the victim, and it's like, oh, none of these people. Uh, it's a guy in our database who's a petty criminal who, by the way, uses knives and has broken, recently broken into a place uh, and was found there and, and, and really didn't seem to be that stable mentally, to be honest with you, uh, Rudy Gaudet. So, um, I don't remember how long a time it was, but, but Amanda and Raphael, they had already said case closed. The, 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 uh, the police had already said, we've closed this case. All right, maybe, maybe not, but one last question. 
Yeah. Right, right. Could you explain like the, uh, the measurement system? I think you said RUFs or RFUs. Oh, RFUs? You would, you would think that going, being that they were roommates and staying in Chesco's quarters, walking to the crime scene would be contaminated. Well, and, and that's the thing. You know, DNA is kind of funny that way, though, or at least our testing for it. So, uh, as I said, you know, um, there was no DNA from anyone but the victim and uh, Rudy Gaudet in Meredith Kircher's room. Well, you would have expected some possible for some of the other roommates. I mean, Amanda had been in a room before. And of course, that's the worry from a defense point of view is, well, wait a minute, these people live together. So an example that I give is, you know, sometimes I'll get a case where they find one sperm in a child's underwear. And the question is, is that evidence of sexual assault? Well, the child's not producing sperm. Where did it come from? Oh, well, it matches, there's also DNA from dad there. Well, we now know that occasionally, and I don't want to throw out all evidence like this, but, it, but sperm can transfer in a, in a washing machine. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, there are problems. When you deal with a case where people are living together and you're trying to find a DNA chain, um, I think there's a lot of danger in that. And most labs will realize that, but I see this evidence introduced all the time where they'll, they'll make it sound like, uh, because a family member's DNA is found near a body or on a body of another family member that they have to have been involved in the murder, and that's just not true. So, you know, DNA is great at giving us identity. It's not really good at telling us how that identity got transferred. This is the, the example. I'll give you a math problem. I give this to my students. Uh, how many people swim in a public swimming pool this summer? Okay. If one person jumps in with an ejaculate on their body or in their body, I know, my, my students are like, do you have to always talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> I do. So uh, that's 300 million cells, one ejaculate. A little teaspoon of sperm is 300 million cells. I mean, it's an amazing thing the human body does. There are 300,000 gallons in an Olympics pool. So go ahead and do the math. How many strokes do you, how many gallons do you have to go through before you hit a sperm cell? There are 1,000 sperm cells per gallon. 1,000 sperm cells per gallon in that pool for everybody who went in with an ejaculate on them or in them. So as I tell my students, swim with your mouths closed, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, the point is, if you swim at the ocean, same problem, right? Uh, except it's just all the animals are contributing at that point. Uh, and I, mean, I remember being at the Great Barrier Reef and swimming, and it was like soup, because the, the, um, the Great Barrier Reef all at one time releases its gametes. It's like, you know, the, 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 the most gigantic orgasm on the planet is this whole, and this water is just foamy and like soup. But anyway, th that being said, in the old days, I needed a million cells in the 1980s to do a DNA profile. I would need a thousand gallons. But now I can do it from a teaspoon of that water. I can do it from just 20 cells or 10 cells. So one ejaculate in an Olympic pool, give me a teaspoon. If I can get all the cells, I can get a DNA profile. That's the problem with sensitivity, is that we're going to start getting some spurious results we have to really think about how we collect evidence and, and the meaning that we give to evidence. Doesn't mean it's bad, it's very good is the problem. It's so good. And now there's single molecule resolution. The newest thing is I can see every single molecule left behind. Uh, this new parallel sequence. They're not doing it in the crime labs yet, but the medical labs are doing it and it's working brilliantly. So it's coming. Thank you. I'm told we gotta leave. Thanks, I'll stay here or I'll go there. Thank you.